What is appropriate technology? For these children, it would surely be a technical toy which helps them to develop their own creativity, dexterity, technical understanding, their imagination, and curiosity. But this robot doesn't do any of that. It does everything itself. Only by hindering it can the children play with it. Such a technology is only appropriate for its manufacturer. For the user, it is a technology which hinders development. These children have made themselves a toy out of a bamboo stick, a gourd, some string and a tin can. No, no, let, let him do it, but very slow. It is just as noisy and it can move too, but it doesn't make people superfluous. To make this toy, a good deal of technical understanding is needed. And by making it, these children learn more about technology than the others do by playing with a robot. Here, a technical toy becomes a means of development and of change, since it represents a technology which is appropriate to the needs of its user. Since the invention of stone implements, people have continuously been developing new tools and processes to apply the laws of nature for their own benefit. With the help of these technologies, we have changed the world. But at the same time, technology has changed us and our societies. The Industrial Revolution rapidly accelerated this gradual process. But have people's lives become easier because of it? Has their work become less troublesome? Under the social conditions of early capitalism, the principal aim of technological developments was to get, with the help of machines, the greatest possible profit out of human labor. The sense and purpose of the new technologies were not determined by those who created or worked with them, but instead by those who owned them. So the steam engine and the mechanical loom necessarily led to 16-hour workdays and child labor. The new technologies only made work easier for their owners. The workers lost the meaning of their work, and all too often, their work itself. Reduced to being appendages to the machines, they were consequently referred to as hands by the English factory owners. Since then, priorities have hardly changed. They influence all aspects of society and are particularly visible in architecture. Not a steel mill, not a jailhouse, and not a nuclear power station is being constructed here, but a hospital. A place for people whose ills have at least partly been caused by this society. The demand for different development goals and for technologies appropriate to such goals is growing, not only in industrialized countries. One of the leading spokesmen for an alternative development in the third world is Professor Reddy at the Institute of Technology in Bangalore, India. Before one discusses anything about uh, appropriate technology, uh, one should get the definitions right. Uh, and this is particularly important because uh, appropriate technology is defined in a vast number of ways. The crucial question is appropriate to what or appropriate to whom. 
And I would like to start with the view that uh, appropriate technologies are those technologies or sets of technologies which advance development. Of course, this begs the question, what is development? And here I would take the view that development is a process which should be directed towards the satisfaction of basic human needs, material and non-material, starting from the needs of the neediest in order to reduce inequalities between countries and within countries. Secondly, it must be a process which is directed towards a sort of endogenous self-reliance based on social participation and control. And thirdly, it must be a process which should be in harmony with the environment. Not far from Professor Reddy's institute, poor farmers have appropriated, in this sense, a modern technology to their needs. Together with technicians and village craftsmen, they designed and built a simple rig to bore tube wells. Every village blacksmith has the means to make one. It saves labor without replacing the laborers. First of all, a hole about six meters deep is dug. A cylindrical casing is inserted to prevent the walls from collapsing. At the depth of about six meters, there is a porous layer through which an underground river flows. Its waters only come to the surface occasionally during the rainy season. A wet, muddy layer indicates that water is not far off. Now the actual tubes for the well, here made out of plastic, are screwed together. At the bottom is the suction tube. The gravel prevents its slits from getting plugged up. Then the tube is inserted. Now only the motor pump needs to be installed and connected. For a single poor Indian farmer, this technology would hardly be appropriate. He would have to go into debt with the money lender and his land and well would sooner or later end up in the hands of a landlord. But in this case, the poor farmers have joined together to form a village association, thereby creating the social and economic preconditions to use such technologies, and if necessary, to defend them. Here too in Guatemala, a cooperative is behind efforts to build cheap earthquake-proof houses with simple means. Only the tin for the roofs, which have to be light, is imported. The frame is bound with locally produced barbed wire. The broken clay bricks from their house, which the last earthquake destroyed, are filled in between the rows of wire. Later, a rough plaster is put on the walls and the house is finished. It is earthquake-proof, easy to construct, 
and cheap enough for poor farmers and laborers. This workshop was set up to produce cement blocks for larger buildings. Using a simple machine and local cement, workers with a little training are manufacturing bricks for sale and for the cooperative's own use. Such examples might imply that only small-scale technologies are appropriate or adaptable to conditions in the developing countries. As long as such technologies are only developed and applied on small projects, this might be a valid conclusion. However, there are conditions under which large-scale centralized technologies may also be appropriate. Limpopo Valley in Mozambique in southern Africa. This vast and fertile river valley could one day feed the population of all of southern Africa. Three rice harvests a year are quite possible here. But year after year in the rainy season, the Limpopo overflows its banks and floods the rice fields, destroying large parts of the crops. Roads are submerged, houses flooded. By fishing, the people try to stave off hunger. Only a large, centrally planned and directed project to regulate the river, one which is also ecologically sound, could change the situation. And at the same time, open up one of Africa's potentially richest granaries. In the People's Republic of Mozambique today, the social and political preconditions have been created to prevent such a technology from serving only an elite. Of course, one has to be very careful in this uh, whole process. Uh, one has to scrutinize technologies very carefully because uh, in many cases the scale of a technology has been increased uh, and not because it is more technically efficient, efficient but because it may permit for instance the owners of the technology to control the labor process for instance and uh, uh, acquire greater profits for instance. So. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I take the view that uh, the set of appropriate technologies must be a mix. There will be certain large-scale technologies which will necessarily have to be included as appropriate and also a vast number of other small-scale technologies. Now, this whole question is important because the main mechanism which many developing countries have uh, used for industrialization uh, is the mechanism of transfer of technology. And here we should note that the definition which we have used uh, of appropriateness necessarily means that what is appropriate in one context need not be appropriate in another context. So it is quite possible that certain technologies may be appropriate for the developed countries, but they need not be appropriate for the developing countries and therefore the insistence on looking at the appropriateness of technologies is I believe a powerful way for developing countries to prevent inappropriate technologies from being imported into the country. The International Hanover Industrial Fair is the world's biggest marketplace for technologies. Here mainly the industrialized countries display their latest developments. With increasingly complicated and sophisticated technologies, they secure themselves a technological head start, which means not only economic, but also political power. For them, the development of the third world is only possible through the transfer of such technologies from the industrialized countries. Multinational and state-owned corporations which possess these technologies profit the most from this development strategy. Their concept of an international division of labor assigns the role of supplier of natural resources and cheap labor to the developing countries, while the industrialized countries, with their capital and research-intensive know-how, hold all the strings in their hands. Thus, the unequal divisions of manual and intellectual labor, of worker and boss, are to be cemented on a worldwide scale between industrialized and developing countries. When 
technologies are imported, they carry with them uh, certain social structures which have to be built in order to facilitate the working of those technologies. And I, always, I have often uh, preferred to look upon technology like uh, genetic material uh, which carries the code of the society in which it was conceived and nurtured. And when you transfer technology, it tries to replicate the society which conceived it. And therefore, large-scale transfer of inappropriate technologies into developing countries automatically set these developing countries into patterns of development uh, or patterns of growth which resemble the uh, developed countries. And this is how you find that in many developing countries you have what, are, what have come to be known as dual societies, uh, little urban islands of affluence set amidst uh, vast oceans of uh, rural uh, poverty. Nuclear energy is a good example of the social repercussions of technology. In 1977, when people from several European countries came together in a peaceful protest against the construction of a fast breeder reactor in Kalkar and the German-Dutch border, they were confronted with what has become known as the atom state. In time, you may discover everything there is to discover, and your progress will still only be a progressing away from mankind. The gap between you and them will one day be so wide that your cheers over some new achievement will be answered by a universal gasp of horror. So Bertolt Brecht's Galilei to his fellow scientists. Some people consider intermediate and small-scale technologies like wind generators, solar collectors, or solar cookers an alternative not only for atomic power, but also a cure-all for social problems, for the reduction of inequalities or lopsided development. But here it seems that the technocrats' blind faith in technology is being as blindly transferred to small-scale technologies. As to whether appropriate technology in itself can solve development problems and in particular can uh, reduce inequalities, we have to be very clear on this issue that technology is only an instrument. Like all instruments, it must be specifically designed and chosen to advance the objectives of that uh, instrument. But whether the instrument will be used whether it will be wielded effectively does not depend so much on the instrument as upon the user of the instrument. What I'm trying to say is that uh, appropriate technology is a necessary condition for development, but it's not a sufficient condition. In addition, it is absolutely essential that the whole socio-economic political framework be conducive to the utilization of appropriate technology, even if it is introduced into that society. In other words, if you have a socio-economic framework which is fundamentally inimical to appropriate technology and which is only interested in importing uh, highly, uh, the technologies of the highly uh, industrialized countries because such technologies 
consolidate and strengthen a small elite, then the deployment of appropriate technology really becomes uh, conditional up, uh, upon some extent of undermining of the power of, uh, of such an elite. The industrialized countries, which are dependent on such elites in developing countries, have also, of course, recognized this. So alongside their space age technologies, more and more companies are producing intermediate technologies under the label of appropriate technology, which are better adapted to the special geographical conditions of many developing countries. Thus, the companies are hoping to retain their domination on the market for such technologies also. Highly sophisticated solar power stations, as can be seen from these models here, will hardly contribute to reducing social and economic inequalities. Instead, they will strengthen the position of the elite who can use them and will increase the dependency on the industrialized countries and their technologies. Appropriateness is never only a question of design or size. It can often happen that so-called appropriate technologies are <clears throat> technologies which are conceived by many, particularly in the developed countries, to be appropriate, end up by being, um, by end up by facilitating or consolidating the interests of a small group. Now, the case of Gobo gas plants uh, is a classical case. Uh, in our own study of Gobo gas plants, which we made in 1974, we pointed out that because a small percentage of 10, 10 to 12 percent of people in the village own sufficient cows to run a small biogas plant, and because the same small 10 percent has enough um, capital to buy a uh, small uh, goba gas plant, if one insists on developing biogas technology only through small biogas plants, it will end up as a device which uh, only benefits the rural rich. Courtyard of a landlord in southern India. He alone in the village can afford a gobar gas plant, which provides him with gas for the kitchen. His more than 20 dairy cows, crossbred with European breeds, give him a decisive advantage over the peasant farmer with perhaps a single milk buffalo. The lot of the day laborer who collects the cow dung mixes it with water and then pours it through an opening into the underground tank has not been improved by this technology. Methane gas develops under pressure in the container and then is piped to the house. The landlord no longer needs to buy firewood from poor wood collectors. The social gap between rich and poor widens even more. Of course, this is uh, not necessarily the only option. Uh, we can go in for community-sized biogas plants, which are large enough to take in the whole uh, animal base of a village um, and process them and produce fertilizer and gas for distribution for the whole village. Such a community-scale biogas plant would not be inappropriate for development because it would uh, provide uh, fuel for the neediest uh, sections of the village who today either have to depend upon firewood or upon dung cakes and therefore it would be satisfying the basic criterion of appropriateness which I su suggested, namely does it benefit the needs of the neediest or not. So in the biogas uh, example we have a uh, very clear case of how uh, small can be very ugly and not beautiful. Um, and this is an important point to make because of a prevailing view of appropriateness that uh, in all situations, small is beautiful. And here we can see quite clearly that the small is not beautiful at all.
China is considered one of the few countries where all the conditions for the employment and the development of appropriate technology, as we have defined it, have so far come together. China relies on both simple small-scale technologies as well as on sophisticated large-scale technologies. The most modern methods of engineering or electronics are developed and applied, as are traditional techniques. Here in a village, medicines are being distilled from herbs in the traditional way. Without redefining the goals of development, all this would not have been possible. Profit maximizing for the benefit of a few had to be replaced by the improvement of the quality of life for as many as possible. To bring about this new definition, a political revolution was necessary, but the Chinese were also able to draw from their rich cultural heritage. In the old Chinese ethic, man was always considered a part of nature, never above it. The highest ideal was to live in harmony with nature. The Christian ethic, on the other hand, assigns man to rule over nature and calls on him to conquer the earth. We too will have to learn that technology should not be a means of subjecting and exploiting nature and its creations. Instead, Technology can be a tool to understand and utilize nature's laws in order to live in harmony with it. Only then will we be able to develop and appropriate technologies to serve human needs.